Today, my speech is entitled, Why Recognize and Resist is Not Catholic. Anyone familiar with the traditional movement knows what recognize and resist means. It's, it's one of the three positions that I explained in my earlier talk. One is that of the uh, Novus Ordo Conservative, the second is that of recognize and resist, that is, the Novus Ordo hierarchy is the true Catholic hierarchy, but we resist virtually everything they say. We re repudiate it. And the third is the state of Acanthist. <clears throat> so it is the position of those who say that, on the one hand, it is necessary to recognize the Novus Ordo hierarchy as the true Catholic hierarchy, who have the power from Christ to teach, rule, and sanctify the church. But on the other hand, it is necessary to resist them in their imposition of the reforms of Vatican II to the point of ignoring their existence practically. And this is the position of the present Society of St. Pius X. It is also the position of what we call the Resistance Society of St. Pius X. <clears throat> they uh, say that, the, uh, as Archbishop Lefebvre said, uh, we must sift the magisterium to find out what is Catholic and what is not Catholic. So if in their judgment something is not in conformity with tradition, then they reject it. If it is in conformity with tradition, they accept it. That's recognize and resist. Is it permitted, however, to sift the Pope's magisterium even when it is not solemn? And see, they say the only untouchable thing is the solemn magisterium. You can't sift that. But everything else you can sift because they say it's not infallible. Is it legitimate to reject the liturgical reforms of Vatican II? Is it legitimate to ignore and reject the, the disciplinary reforms of Vatican II? So those are the questions. Now, the usual state of Acantist argument that you hear is this, that the people who appear to be Roman Catholic popes profess heresy and therefore are not popes because they profess heresy. That is That argument has absolute validity and it is very capable of being supported by all sorts of authorities. But in general, I do not argue that way, because I think that you get into a, uh, how would you say, a storm of canonical distinctions, theologians, uh, statements from popes, etc., that is impossible for the layperson to figure out. You would have to know Latin, you would have to go to a great Catholic university, look up all of these references, what did this one say, what did that one say? And so I think it gets bogged down and it really just confuses the faithful. The, so I, in, in an argument I will never use it, although I think it's a true argument because I know all of the underpinning of it, but the lay person cannot attain the underpin, underpinning of it. So, the argument that I always use and others is that what I gave you in the previous talk, and that is that the Catholic Church is infallible and indefectible by the assistance of the Holy Ghost, and that uh, therefore it is impossible that it prescribe for the Church a new religion, an erroneous religion, false liturgy, evil liturgy, false doctrines, false and evil practices, the disciplines, uh, phony saints, etc. It is impossible. And because that is impossible, you must look for where the defection has taken place because we're obviously in the presence of the defection. Your very assistance at a traditional Latin mass, not approved by 
the supposed pope or supposed local bishop is evidence of the fact that you know that there has been a defection. No one has to tell you that there's a new religion in your Novus Ordo parish. That you know. And the resistance priests know that. Otherwise they wouldn't do what they're doing, running all around the world to provide the traditional mass sacraments and doctrine and so forth to people who aren't interested in it. So that's, that's a given fact that everyone understands. So if there is a defection, we cannot look for the defection in the church, which is assisted by Christ, in the authority of the church, which is assisted by Christ. We have to look for the defection someplace else, that is, where it can take place, and that is in individual human beings who have themselves defected from the faith and wish to impose this defection from the faith upon the institutions of the church. And that is Giovanni Roncalli, a modernist his whole life, who submerged after the repression of Pius X and emerged in the 1950s as a flaming modernist. That's Montini, that's and so forth, the others, who had this intention of imposing upon the church modernism, which was the goal of the modernists, the express goal of the modernist. And the modernist authors at the time said, stay in the church, don't leave it, submerge, and you'll see one day we will have our day. This quotes to that effect many times in the writings of the modernists around the time of Pius X. And that's what happened. And that conforms to history. That's, they planned it, they did it. It conforms to history. It makes all the common sense in the world that that's what happened. But to try to make sense of all of this defection coming from a Catholic hierarchy puts you into an impossible problem with the church's infallibility and indefectibility. Impossible. Now, all of these people, uh, whether SSPX or resistance priests, or, they're all of goodwill, good intention. I'm not here to throw rocks at them. Uh, they, they simply want to preserve the Catholic faith. I have no doubt about that. It's just that their position is erroneous, and I want to point out why it's erroneous. The, we'll call them R and R, adherents claim that it is illegitimate, excuse me, that it is legitimate to reject doctrines, liturgical practices, and disciplines when they are not in accordance with tradition in their judgment. They say that the magisterium and disciplines emanating from the Vatican, since Vatican Council II, must be sifted in order to determine what is Catholic in them and what is not. And that comes directly from Archbishop Lefebvre. He used the word sift in French, trier. We have to sift the magisterium and all of what comes out of the Vatican to see what's Catholic in it or not. So that position comes from him. My response to this claim is that it is not permitted to reject the doctrines, liturgical laws, and disciplinary laws of the Pope. Even when he is not using his full authority to define, even when he is not declaring something to be defined. Very important. My first argument is from the authority of the popes themselves. The this, this second argument will be from the universal consent of theologians. The third argument will be from reason. The fourth argument will be to say that no pope, no theologian, nor reason itself supports the R&R &R position. Finally, I will show how the R&R &R position is the same of the arch-modernist Hans Kung, by quotes from him. Now, review of the ordinary universal magisterium. We talked about that in the previous talk, and so I don't see any reason to mention it again here. Now, first, the testimony of the popes against recognize and resist. 
in matters of doctrine and discipline. Now, these are papal quotations. Be patient with them. They are important because these are popes speaking and we should listen. And they will manifest that the recognize and resist position is untenable. First, Gregory XVI in 1841, the letter Perlatum ad nos to the Archbishop of Lemberg. He says, with God's help, your clergy will never have any more pressing anxiety than to preach the true Catholic faith. He who does not keep it whole and without error will indubitably be lost. They will endeavor, therefore, to favor union with the Catholic Church. He's talking about schismatics. For he who is separated from it will not have life. They will maintain obedience to this sovereign chair of Peter, in which Christ the Lord laid the foundation of this same church, and where, consequently, is to be found that the entire and uh, that entire and perfect stability of the Christian religion. See, so I'll read that again. They will maintain obedience to this sovereign chair of Peter, in which Christ the Lord laid the foundation of this same church, and where, consequently, as a result, consequently, is to be found the entire and perfect stability of the Christian religion. So because Christ is assisting it, it therefore has the entire and perfect stability of the Christian religion. Now this is against recognize and resist, for their position requires them to identify with the Roman Catholic Church all of the doctrinal, moral, liturgical, and disciplinary aberrations of Vatican II. Such a position makes it impossible for the Catholic Church to be the entire and perfect stability of the Christian religion which he says depends precisely on, the, on the, the assistance of Christ. Pius IX, <clears throat> in the letter to us, Libenter, December 21st, 1863, to the Archbishop of Munich, <clears throat> he's talking about a, a meeting of theologians in Munich. We address to the members of this well-merited praise because, <clears throat> rejecting as we expected they would, this false distinction between the philosopher and the philosophy of which we have spoken in earlier letters, they have recognized and accepted that all Catholics are obliged in conscience in their writings to obey the dogmatic decrees of the Catholic Church, which is infallible. Now listen. In giving them the praise which is their due for confessing a truth which flows necessarily from the obligation of the Christian faith, we love to think that they have not intended to restrict this obligation of obedience, which is strictly binding on Catholic professors and writers, solely to the points defined by the infallible judgment of the Church as dogmas of faith which all men must believe. So he's saying, you don't restrict the ascent of faith merely to things that are solemnly defined. And we are persuaded that they have not intended to declare that this perfect adhesion to revealed truths, which they have recognized to be absolutely necessary to the true progress of science and the refutation of error, could be theirs if faith and obedience are only accorded to dogmas expressly defined by the church. So he is condemning the idea that you only need to believe what has been solemnly declared by the church and that everything else is up for grabs. He's condemning that. <clears throat> he says, even when it is only a question of submission owed to divine faith, this cannot be limited merely to points defined by the express decrees of the ecumenical councils or of the Roman pontiffs and of this apostolic see. This submission must also be extended to all that has been handed down as divinely revealed by the ordinary teaching authority of the entire church spread over the whole world, and which for this reason Catholic theologians with the universal and constant consent regard as being of the faith. So he says you must give the assent of faith 
to what is taught by the ordinary universal magisterium. <clears throat> but since it is a question of the submission obliging in conscience all those Catholics who are engaged in the study of speculative sciences so as to procure for the Church new advantages by their writings, the members of the Congress must recognize that it is not sufficient for Catholic scholars to accept and respect the dogmas of the Church which we have been speaking about, namely the expressly defined ones and the ordinary universal magisterium. They must besides submit themselves whether to doctrinal decisions stemming from pontifical congregations or to points of doctrines, doctrine which with common and constant consent are held in the church as truths and theological conclusions so certain that opposing opinions, though they may not be dubbed heretical, nonetheless merit some other form of theological censure. So that means that we must accept everything that is taught by the solemn magisterium, everything taught by the universal magisterium, and everything which the church teaches even in the pontifical congregations, the holy office. We must accept those things. <clears throat> and even though those things may not pertain to dogma, nevertheless, we must give them our assent. We are not free to dissent from things that are taught by the apostolic see. So there is absolutely no mention here of rejecting things based on your idea of tradition. Again, Pius the Ninth, in the apostolic letter, Non Sine Gravissimo, February 24th, 1870, to the apostolic delegate of Constantinople. To carry out your mission with exactitude, venerable brother, you will have to recall and to inculcate, inculcate in the faithful, committed to your care, this truth which is part of the Catholic faith, namely that the Roman pontiff, in the person of blessed Peter, has received from our Lord Jesus Christ the full power and authority to feed, to guide, and to govern the universal church. That the free and entire exercise of this power can can recognize no limitation or re restriction in point of territories or of nationalities. And listen, and that all those who glory in the title of Catholic must not only be united to him in matters of faith and dogmatic truth, but also be submissive to him in matters of liturgy and discipline. So the rejection of the new mass and rejection of the new sacraments by the Society of St. Pius X contradicts that because he's saying you must be submissive to me in matters of liturgy and discipline. You cannot, you cannot accept those things and set them aside. <clears throat> and not only do they set them aside, they set up a counter apostolate to the apostolate of the Pope and bishops in their eyes. And without any authorization And you know, they, they justify this as, as, as something as Catholic, and it is not Catholic at all. Pius IX again, the Apostolic Constitution Pastor Eternus, July 18, 1870, which is the first Vatican Council. Hence, we teach and declare that by the appointment of our Lord, the Roman Church possesses the, a sovereignty of ordinary power over all other churches. And that this power of jurisdiction of the Roman Pontiff, which is truly Episcopal, is immediate, to which all of whatsoever right and dignity, both pastors and the faithful, both individually and collectively, are bound by their duty of hierarchical subordination and true obedience to submit, not only in matters which belong to faith and morals, but also in those that appertain to the discipline and government of the Church throughout the whole world. So we are bound to obey in discipline so that the Church of Christ may be one flock under one supreme pastor through the preservation of unity, both of communion and of profession of the same faith with the Roman Pontiff. Listen, this is the teaching of Catholic truth from which no one can deviate without loss of faith and of salvation. It's very serious. Pius IX again, 
encyclical Quarta Supra, January 6, 1873, to the Armenians. <clears throat> he says, in fact, it is as contrary to the divine constitution of the church as it is to perpetual and constant tradition for anyone to attempt to prove the Catholicity of his faith and truly call himself a Catholic when he fails in obedience to the apostolic see. For it is necessary for all the other churches, that is, for all the faithful of the entire world, to be in agreement with this see by reason of its sovereign primacy. And he who abandons <clears throat> the chair of Peter, on which the church is founded, is falsely persuaded that he is in the church, since he is already a sinner and a schismatic who raises up a chair against the one chair of Peter, from which flow to all others the sacred rites of communion. He continues, all these declarations are so emphatic that we must conclude from them that a man who has been declared schismatic by the Roman pontiff must cease absolutely to claim the name of Catholic so long as he fails to recognize and does not expressly revere that pontiff's power and its fullness. <clears throat> he continues, but since the neo-schismatics cannot reap any advantage from it, they have applied themselves to follow in the footsteps of modern heretics. They have excused themselves by saying that the sentence of excommunication pronounced against them in our name by our venerable brother, the Archbishop of Tiana, apostolic delegate to Constantinople, was unjust and therefore null and void. That's exactly what SSPX has always said. And here, he, he, Pius IX is condemning the schismatics for saying that precise thing, that you can just blow off a, a, an excommunication because you think it's unjust. And then listen, they have even gone so far as to say that they could not submit to it for fear that the faithful, once deprived of their ministry, would espouse the cause of the heretics. So they blew off the excommunication saying, we have to function, we have to have a ministry in order to protect the people from the heretics. <laughs> It's in black and white. You can look it up if you want. Condemned by Pius IX. He says, Pius IX says, here is surely a new kind of reason, absolutely unheard of, quite unknown to the fathers of the church. In fact, the entire church in every part of the world knows that the see of St. Peter the Apostle has the power to loose the bonds imposed by the sentence of any bishop, no matter who he may be, since this see has the right to judge the affairs of the church, and no one may lawfully appeal against that judgment. He continues, but the neo-schismatics say that there is no question of dogma, but only of discipline because it is discipline which is concerned in our Constitution of 1867. And consequently, the name of Catholic cannot be forbidden those who refuse to recognize it. But you understand without difficulty, we are convinced, how useless and vain such a subterfuge is. For the Catholic Church has always considered schismatic all those who obstinately resist the authority of her legitimate prelates resist. And especially her supreme pastor. And any who, anyone who refuses to execute their orders and even to recognize their authority. So he, he regards them as schismatics. The members of the Armenian, Armenian faction of Constantinople, having followed this line of conduct, no one, under any pretext, can believe them innocent of the sin of schism, even if they had not been denounced as schismatic by the apostolic authority. Now, listen. The, note the distinction of the sin of schism and that one can be guilty of the sin of schism before any legal declaration. The same may be said of the sin of heresy. See, they always say, well, Bergoglio has not been condemned as a heretic, and we cannot condemn him as a heretic, therefore we must recognize him. 
You can be guilty of the sin before you are declared. Pius IX again, the encyclical Que in Patriarchatu, uh, September 1st, 1876, to the clergy and faithful of the Chaldean Rite. The, this is addressed to people who say, you're the Pope, but we're going to do our own thing. He says, what good is it to proclaim aloud the dogma of the supremacy of St. Peter and his successors? What good is it to repeat over and over declarations of faith in the Catholic Church and of obedience to the Apostolic See when actions give the lie to these fine words? I mean, it sounds like you're addressing that to Bishop Fellay. You know, he's the Pope, he's the Pope, he's the Pope, and then they ignore him, do whatever they please, set up seminaries, schools, everything. He says, moreover, is not rebellion rendered all the more inexcusable by the fact that obedience is recognized as a duty? It's, it's hand in glove for SSPX. <clears throat> Again, does not the authority of the Holy See extend as a sanction to the measures which we have been obliged to take? Or is it enough to be in communion of faith with this See without adding the submission of obedience, a thing which cannot be maintained without damaging the Catholic faith? Without damaging the Catholic faith. It's very serious that you can, you can say, well, I'm in communion with the with the See of Rome, but we don't have to obey you. That damages the Catholic faith. So I'm saying this, I'm pointing these out to, to show you that their system is absolutely at odds with the mind of the church. That he's the Pope, but we do what we please. We ignore his excommunication, we ignore his rules, we ignore his dogma, we ignore everything, but he's the Pope. He continues, in fact, venerable brethren, beloved sons, it is a question of recognizing the power of this see, apostolic see, even over your churches, not merely in what pertains to faith, but also in what concerns discipline. He who would deny this is a heretic. He who recognizes this and obstinately refuses to obey is worthy of anathema. Very serious words. Therefore, let those who have gone astray from the right path under the impression that things were otherwise hasten to repent. Let all, if they entertain a sincere charity for their patriarch, as they should, make every effort to bring him back to the right path, either by petition or by exhortation or by prayers to God, each one as the Lord shall inspire him. So it's contrary to the mind of the church to recognize the hierarchy and at the same time disobey and ignore them. It's worthy of anathema. Leo XIII, in the encyclical Sapientiae Christiane of January 10th, 1890, he says, this is about the universal ordinary magisterium, in fixing the limits of obedience, let none imagine that the authority of the bishops and especially of the Roman pontiff, is only to be respected in matters of dogma, the obstinate rejection of which cannot be distinguished from the crime of heresy. Nor is it by any means sufficient that a sincere and firm assent be given to the teachings delivered by the Church, which, though not defined by solemn acts, are nevertheless, by common and universal consent, believed as divinely revealed, and which the Vatican Council decreed as of Catholic and divine faith. But it is moreover, which refers to universal magis, ordinary magisterium, but it is moreover a chief duty of Christians to permit themselves to be ruled and guided by the bishops, and particularly by the apostolic see. Leo XIII in the encyclical Satis Cognitum of 1899, uh, 1896, I, six, I think, he says, whatsoever referring to our Lord, whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth, it shall be bound also in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth, it shall be loosed also in heaven. 
unquote. Leo XIII continues, this metaphorical expression of binding and loosing indicates the power of making laws, of judging and punishing, and the power is said to be of such amplitude and force that God will ratify whatever is decreed by it. God will ratify whatever is decreed by it, whatever. Thus, it is supreme and absolutely independent, this power, so that having no other power on earth as its superior, it embraces the whole church and all things committed to the church. There's no room for sifting, for recognize and resist in those, in those statements. He continues, it follows then that the Church of Christ not only exists today and always, but is also exactly the same as it was in the time of the Apostles. Unless we were to say, which God forbid, either that Christ our Lord could not effect His purpose, meaning of sustaining the Church and, help, uh, and assisting the Church, or that He erred when He asserted that the gates of hell should never prevail against it. So he's saying that the church, uh, it follows from everything that he has said that not only does the church exist today and always, but exactly the same as it was from the time of Christ. And if that's not true, then we would have to say that Christ was telling a lie. That's extremely powerful. He says, may God forbid, I mean, even to say it, to, to put that in words. So if you're saying that there, there is a defection that you must resist that comes down from the Roman pontiff, then you would have to say that Christ erred when he said that the gates of hell would never prevail against it. So the SSPX, in rejecting the forms of Vatican II and in mounting an anti-apostolate to that of the Pope, in quotation marks, are logically bound to say that the Church has erred in her universal teachings, liturgy, and discipline. If not, why don't we just accept it? <clears throat> Only the state of Acantus position preserves the Church from this defection. Treating as it does the modernist so-called popes as intruders who do not and indeed never did possess the power to teach, rule, and sanctify the Church. They're hijackers. Pope Pius XI said, Mortalium Animos, 1928, this church, after being so wonderfully instituted, could not, on the removal by death of its founder and of the apostles who were the pioneers in propagating it, be entirely extinguished and cease to be. For to it was given the commandment to lead all men without distinction of time or place, to eternal salvation. Going, therefore, teach ye all nations. In the continual carrying out of this task, will any element of strength and efficiency be wanting to the Church when Christ himself is perpetually present to it, according to his solemn promise, Behold, I am with you all days, even to the consummation of the world? It follows, the Pope continues, then that the Church of Christ not only exists today and always, but is also exactly the same as it was at the time of the Apostles, unless we were to say, which God forbid, he's quoting Leo XIII, either that Christ our Lord could not effect this purpose, or that he erred when he asserted that the gates of hell should never prevail against it. A quote from Leo XIII. Pius XII and the encyclical Mystici Corporis, 1943. Nevertheless, this most noble title of the Church must not be so understood as if that ineffable bond by which the Son of God assumed a definite human nature belongs to the universal Church. But it consists in this that our Savior, he's talking about Christ as the head of the Church, but it consists in this that our Savior shares prerogatives par peculiarly his own with the Church in such a way that she may portray in her whole life, both exterior and interior, a most faithful image of Christ. 
For in virtue of the juridical mission by which our divine Redeemer sent his apostles into the world, as he had been sent by the Father, it is he who through the church, <clears throat> it is he who through the church baptizes, teaches, rules, looses, binds, offers sacrifices. So he's saying that all of the essential acts of the church are those of Christ. That is, teaching, baptizing, teaching, ruling, loosing, binding, offering sacrifice, and doing the sacrifice. That's the infallibility and indefectibility of the church. <clears throat> so for this reason, it is necessary to see all of the universal teachings, disciplines, and liturgical, this is me talking, and, and liturgical laws of the Catholic Church is coming from Christ. The implications of this doctrine are obvious with regard to the Novus Ordo. Hence, to be consistent with this doctrine, one must either be a Sativacantist, thereby dissociating the Novus Ordo religion from Christ, or admit that all of the doctrinal, liturgical, and the disciplinary changes proceed from the will of Christ. They are all from Christ, according to Pius XII. But to assert such a thing would be to admit essential change and contradiction in the Catholic Church, which is contrary to faith, which we have just heard from Leo XIII. Pope Pius XII in encyclical Humani Generis, 1950. Nor must it be thought that what is expounded in encyclical letters does not of itself demand consent, since in writing such letters the popes do not exercise the supreme power of their teaching authority. For these matters are taught with the ordinary teaching authority, of which it is true to say, he who heareth you, heareth me. And generally, what is expounded and inculcated in encyclical letters already for other reasons appertains to Catholic doctrine. Now listen, but if the Supreme Pontiffs in their official documents purposely pass judgment on a matter up to that time under dispute, it is obvious that that matter, according to the mind and will of the same Pontiffs, cannot be any longer considered a question open to discussion among theologians. In other words, it's final. You can't sift it. And I will give you some of the uh, testimony from a theologian by the name of Monsignor Fenton. He was an American who uh, operated the um, uh, American Ecclesiastical Review. He's from the 40, 30s, 40s, early 50s maybe. And he did a whole study on what is owed to documents and decisions of the Holy See which are neither solemn magisterium nor ordinary universal magisterium but simply pronouncements of popes and of the acts of the Vatican, the Holy Office particularly. What is owed to that? He did a whole study of what theologians said, and I'll read you some of what he says. <clears throat> he says, all theological works dealing with this subject make it perfectly clear that all Catholics are bound seriously in conscience, seriously in conscience, that means mortal sin if you don't, to accept the teaching contained in these documents with a true internal religious assent. See, that is what canon law says. See, the, the, there is solemn magisterium, number one. Number two, ordinary universal magisterium. And then something much more common, which we call, uh, it has, goes by various names, authentic magisterium, pontifical ordinary magisterium. It's the third level, and that is where a pope is teaching, but he's not binding. Very common in encyclicals. He's teaching, but not binding. What assent do we owe to that? That's the question. And we owe what is known as a true internal religious assent under pain of mortal sin. 
they, the theologians, and he did and this loaded with footnotes, he did all the work, all insist that even in this portion of his ordinary magisterium, this third level, the Holy Father has the right to demand and actually has demanded a definite and unswerving internal assent to his teaching from all Catholics. So you can't sift it. He says, <clears throat> the certain doctrine of theologians <clears throat> it is the certain doctrine of theologians that the internal and sincere assent due to the teachings presented even in a non-infallible way by the supreme teacher and ruler of the church militant is definitely and seriously obligatory you are not free to sift it. And you commit a mortal sin if you do. <clears throat> he says, furthermore, the magisterium of the church has been equipped with help from God by reason of which the, the uh, first sort of teaching gives infallible truth, while this second affords infallible security. And what he means is that the church, in proposing these things in a non-infallible way, has security from teaching you something pernicious and evil and wrong. So it, something that would be a sin to accept. It cannot teach you, for example, that divorced and remarried people can receive Holy Communion. It cannot. So what is not infallible, obviously, is clearly fallible. It is reformable. The church could go back on it in the future. But it could never teach you something, even if it reverses itself in the future on something. It could never teach you something evil. Because it has the assistance of Christ. You can accept whatever comes down from the, the Holy Father and the Vatican as something that you can adhere to without any sin, without adhering to something condemned by the church, even if the church does not propose it as infallible. It's very important because recognize and resist sees all of those things as open for grabs. All the theologians, he says, are convinced that all Catholics are bound in conscience to give a de definite internal religious assent to those doctrines which the Holy Father teaches when he speaks to the universal church of God on earth without employing his God-given charism of infallibility. He says this assent is due until the church might choose to modify the teaching previously presented or until proportionately serious reasons for abandoning the non-infallible teaching contained in a pontifical document might appear. So he says, and all theologians say, a theologian could privately dissent from it, but he could not publicly do so. And in any case, you could never be taught something which is evil or pernicious or condemned. He says, God has given the Holy Father a kind of infallibility distinct from the charism of doctrinal infallibility in the strict sense. He has so constructed and ordered the church that those who follow the directives given to the entire kingdom of God on earth will never be brought into the position of ruining themselves spiritually through this obedience. So the, the, the model that the SSPX has of, of, of Va Vatican II and all of its reforms as evil and having to be sifted and rejected and so forth is contrary to the, to the at least to the constant teaching of, uh, and, and universal teaching of theologians. There is no basis for it anywhere. <clears throat> <clears throat> he 
He says, it is of course possible that the church might come to modify its stand on some detail of teaching presented as non-infallible matter, matter in a papal encyclical. The nature of this authority of doctrinal providence, as he calls it, within the church is such, however, that this fallibility, this ability to err, extends to questions of relatively minute detail or of particular application. The body of doctrine on the rights and duties of labor, on church and state, or on any other subject treated extensively in a series of papal letters directed to and normative for the entire church militant could not be radically or completely erroneous. The infallible security Christ's wills that his disciples should enjoy within his church is utterly incompatible with such a possibility. So again, to say that you have to sift it and that you can reject it, destroys the notion of the infallibility and indefectibility of the Catholic Church. <clears throat> Speaking about these same decisions, these same, the same subject matter, he says, the man who subjects these declarations to an analysis in order to distinguish the element of Catholic tradition from other sections of the content must employ some norm other than the authority of the Holy Father himself. <clears throat> and that means that the authority is now the sifter. He says, this attitude can be radically destructive of a true Catholic mentality, the sifting mentality. The men who have adopted this mentality imagine that they can analyze the content of an individual encyclical or group of encyclicals in such a way that they can separate the pronouncements which Catholics are bound to accept from those which have merely an ephemeral value, something that will pass away. They would then tell the Catholic people to receive the Catholic principles and to do as they liked about the other elements. It's exactly what SSPX does. <clears throat> so, that's it. Now, proof from reason. Now, testimony. Oh, we said that. Proof from reason against the recognize and resist in matters of doctrine and discipline. The Lefebvreist position, which is that of recognize and resist, is a completely inconsistent position, and it makes nonsense of the indefectibility of the Catholic Church, since it identifies with the Catholic Church the doctrinal and disciplinary defection of Vatican II <clears throat> and its subsequent reforms. For if these are not a defection, then why are we resisting them, as I said before? If these are not a defection, then what could possibly justify the consecration of four bishops in 1988 in defiance of the order of that person whom they say is the representative of Christ on earth? The only thing which justifies the position of the traditionalists in their systematic refusal of Vatican II and its reforms is the fact that these reforms are not Catholic and lead to the destruction of souls. But if they are not Catholic, then those who have promulgated them cannot possibly be bearers of Catholic authority, since if they were, they would have been incapable of promulgating such a thing for the Catholic Church. As Father Chicada says, real men don't eat quiche, and real popes don't promulgate false doctrines. Hence, he always says something humorously, hence the Lefebvre group is in the impossible position of resisting the authority of the Catholic Church in matters of doctrine, discipline, and liturgy, which are the effects of the three essential functions of the hierarchy the function of teaching, ruling, and sanctifying. 
and which are the basis of the threefold unity of the Catholic Church, <clears throat> which is unity of faith, unity of government, and unity of communion. To resist the Catholic Church in these matters is a spiritual suicide, since adherence to the Catholic Church is necessary for salvation. If it is permissible to resist the Church in doctrine, discipline, and worship, then in what is the Church to be obeyed? What is the authority of St. Peter if it can be ignored in these matters? And if the Church can err in, it is so badly in promoting something that is contrary to its tradition, its doctrinal tradition, its disciplinary tradition, its liturgical tradition, then where is its infallibility? Where is its indefectibility? Where is the assistance of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth, and everything that you heard from the mouths of the popes? Where is it? Consequently, recognize and resist is false since it leads to the denial of the indefectibility of the church. Listen to Pope Gregory the 16th, 1830s. It would be beyond any doubt blameworthy and entirely contrary to the respect with, with which the laws of the church should be received by a senseless aberration to find fault with the discipline which she has, has established and which includes the administration of holy things, the regulation of morals, and the laws of the church and her ministers, or to speak of this discipline as opposed to certain principles of the natural law, or to present it as defective, imperfect, and subject to civil authority. Sifting. He says, are they not trying, moreover, to make of the church something human? Are they not openly diminishing her infallible authority and the divine power which guides her in holding that her present discipline is subject to decay, to weakness, and to other failures of the same nature, and in imagining that it contains many elements which are not only useless but even prejudicial to the well-being of the Catholic religion? 1833, fits perfectly, recognize and resist. And the principle of recognize and resist is the doctrine of the arch-modernist Hans Kung. Listen to him. He says, where then in these dark ages was the church's indefectibility really manifested? Not in the hierarchy, and not in theology, but among those innumerable and mostly unknown Christians, and there were always some bishops and theologians also among them, who even in the church's worst periods heard the Christian message and tried to live according to it in faith, love, and hope. So the, the body of the faithful carry the church's doctrine, even though the hierarchy has defected from it. That's Hans Kuhn. He continues, uh, he cites the schismatic patriarchs who wrote to Pius IX in 1848, quote, among us neither patriarchs nor councils could ever introduce new teaching. For the guardian of religion is the very body of the church that is, of the people itself. That's a schismatic talking to Pius IX. And that's exactly the position of SSPX. Kung says, the unvarying constancy and the unerring truth of Christian dogma does not depend on any hierarchical order. It is guarded by the totality by the whole people of the church, which is the body of Christ. <clears throat> he says, the, the church, however, is not simply to be equated with the official church, with pope and bishops. 
It is rather the hidden but completely real church of those who truly believe which cannot err. Because Christ, in accordance with his promise, remains with her to the end of the world, she is the pillar and bulwark of the truth. To this extent, the church has been preserved even under an erring and failing papacy. Hans Kung, arch-modernist, denier of the assumption, he said, and I heard him on television once say, the assumption is an assumption. Arch-heretic, supreme modernist, that's his teaching. That's recognize and resist. These statements mean that the church's hierarchy could err in its teaching to the universal church, but that the infallibility and indefectibility rest with the faithful, as if they had some special assistance from God which was lacking to the hierarchy. Recognize and resist. This is pure modernism. The true indefectibility of the church in these times rests not with sifting the teaching and the laws of the Catholic hierarchy, so-called, but in denouncing those who have deviated from the faith as being false shepherds. That's where the indefectibility lies. And such is the true path to the restoration of order in the church, because it is impossible that the whole church be deceived. It is impossible that the Catholic faith disappear from the face of the earth. And they need to be rejected as false shepherds, not recognized as true shepherds, but rejected as false shepherds because they give us false doctrine. For we cannot associate with the church this modernist hijacking of its institutions. <clears throat> there is no possible third way, just as there is no possible substantial alteration, augmentation, or diminution of the, the positive revelation. And that is, either he is the Pope and we must obey him and accept everything he says with the internal assent and, and faith that, that I described in this talk, or we must say that this is a deviation from the faith and reject them as false shepherds. There is no third way. The only two Catholic positions are those two. The Novus Ordo is either Catholic or it is not. I firmly hold that it is not Catholic, and therefore hold that any system which claims that the Novus Ordo has been given to us by the authority of Christ, which is that of recognize and resist, is objectively blasphemous and ruinous of the Church's indefectibility. Thank you for listening. <clears throat>